that you also forgive us of our sins and forgive us of our shortcomings. We ask for all these things in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Pure in heart. Before our lesson, we'll sing number 37. I hope you realize by now that all these songs actually do have something to do with our topic tonight. If it is convenient for you, would you please stand as we sing.
be seated. If you are using the book, the song number to mark is 768. 768. Before the sermon, I'll be reading from James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may observe us, obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how a great forest a little fire kindles. It's very good to see you tonight, and we want to extend a very special welcome to, uh, to our guests, our visitors that are with us tonight. We have a few of those, and we're grateful that you have come our way. We are uh, really about to finish up our Vacation Bible School uh, this week. It's taking place uh, in the mornings, and uh, tomorrow will be our last day for that. Usually, uh, during VBS week, our Wednesday night uh, assembly here is is a little bit different. It's a little abbreviated, and we usually uh, invite the kids to come and and uh, and we'll kind of go through some of our our material uh, that we've studied that week, and then uh, allow people the opportunity to go look at the classrooms and uh, see what they're studying and all of that. <clears throat> and um, our VBS is a little toned down this year because for a variety of reasons, not the least of which coming out of, of uh, pandemic restrictions and things like that. Uh, and so we decided not to do that and just have our usual Wednesday assembly. Uh, but we failed to announce that. <laughs> and that just completely slipped my mind and I think uh, practically everyone else's mind that, that we weren't going to do our usual Wednesday night VBS uh, uh, type of abbreviated uh, gathering uh, that we were going to do our regular, our regular assembly, and so um, had several people asking me about that, which reminded me that we didn't announce that. So, um, if you were coming expecting that tonight, <clears throat> uh, this is why uh, you're not seeing what you may have been expecting during our VBS week. But we had a good VBS, and and hopefully we will conclude it in a positive way tomorrow morning. I am not a marriage counselor. I, I don't have any training in that. Uh, I had one introduction to counseling class uh, in the School of Preaching here back in, as I've said before, 1900 and none of your business. <clears throat> it's been that long. But that was the only training that, that I had in, in counseling. So I, I, don't, uh, I don't present myself as that, uh, but... I have found myself in the position of offering counsel uh, to married people from time to time who are struggling to make their marriages work. And I haven't done as much of that uh, in my 30 plus years of ministry as I know other ministers have. Uh, I've done some, but I know others have done a lot more of that in their particular works. But I've done it enough to notice that so many of the problems that do come up in our marriages and that cause a lot of the problems that we see in our homes could be avoided in the first place or fixed in the second place if husbands and wives would communicate better. It's very easy to say words. It's not always easy to communicate. And there's a difference 
in those two things. And when communication breaks down in the home, problems are not going to be very far behind. Last week we began what I'm calling a very short series of lessons uh, that I guess if you wanted to give it a broad heading or a broad title, we could call it Making Marriage Great. At least that's what I'm calling it as I file these sermons away. And we're looking at just some general principles that can improve our relationships at home, can improve our, our marriages. And tonight I want us to focus on the importance of healthy communication because it is vital to a healthy marriage. And because that's true, it's no surprise then to find the topic addressed in Scripture. And so let's do that tonight. Just spend a few minutes talking about two things primarily. The power of our speech we'll talk about first. And then in the second place, the majority of our time we'll spend looking at some principles of speech. So let's talk first of all about the power of our words and we go to James chapter 3 for that. James mentions that, talks about that in the early verses of James chapter 3. And he essentially says two things, as I've outlined them, about the power of our speech. First of all, our speech, our, our language, our words have the power to direct. And in the second place, they have the power to destroy. First of all, they have the power to direct. In verses 1 through 4... He offers a warning in the first couple of verses, but I want you to notice specifically verses 3 and 4 as he talks about the power, of our, the power of our words to do great things. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. Now the point that James is making there is he's using two, two comparisons, two analogies. When you compare the size of a bit to the size of the horse, there's a great, there's a great disparity. The bit is very small in comparison to the size of the horse. But that small bit can direct that big animal. Same with the rudder in the ship. The ship is huge. The rudder, in comparison to the rest of the ship, is very small. But that rudder can direct the course of that ship. Now he uses that as an example to say, think about the size of your tongue in comparison to the size of the rest of your body. And how small your tongue is in comparison to the rest of your body. But the tongue, though very small, can determine the direction of your life. And as we think about it in terms of our topic, marriage and the home, our tongues can determine the direction that a marriage goes. Whether that is in a good and positive direction or in a very negative direction. That's how much power we have in our words. And with that power comes the possibility that we can use our tongues to destroy. In verses 5 through 8 of James chapter 3, James talks about that. Toward the end of verse number 5, he says, See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. Think about how a very small match or a very small end of a lit cigarette can be cast out the window of a car and ultimately the result can be thousands and thousands of acres of forest destroyed and hundreds of homes destroyed and businesses destroyed from one small spark. That's the power that fire has to destroy. And James says our tongues are that powerful. If we're not careful, if we don't use them 
in the right way, our tongues can cause that kind of destruction. They can destroy marriages. And so what the writer of Proverbs says in Proverbs 18 verse 21 is certainly true. These words, death and life, are in the power of the tongue. Death and life in the power of the tongue. You and I possess a force that cannot be left uncontrolled. If we leave it uncontrolled, it will destroy, can destroy, your home. Fire can comfort if it's controlled. It can cook our meals if it's controlled. And so it can do good things, but uncontrolled it can destroy. Same is true with our words. Our words can comfort. They can bring joy and happiness into the lives of others. But if we don't control them, they can destroy relationships. Death and life truly are in the power of the tongue. And we ignore that principle to our own peril. Now, in the second place, let's talk about some principles of speech. Talked about the power of our speech, now some principles of our speech. And I've got about, uh, I don't know, six or seven of these that I want to offer to you for your consideration. Now, we're, we're saying these things in the context of marriage specifically, but these are principles of speech that can be applied and should be applied in practically every area of our lives. But think about them, married folks, in the context of your marriage specifically. Unmarried folks, think about them in the possibility of your future marriage, and if not that, think about them in whatever relationship you can think of, because they will fit there too. Principles of proper communication. Here we go. Number one, listen to understand before you speak. Listen to understand before you speak. Now this may sound counterintuitive to some, but I believe it's true because I believe the Bible teaches it. And I believe experience bears it out. That good communication actually begins with being a good listener. That good communication actually begins not with your ability to form your thoughts into words, but in your ability to listen to what the other person is saying. In Proverbs chapter 18, we already mentioned earlier verse 21, death and life being in the power of the tongue. But earlier in that chapter in verse 13, we read these words. He who gives an answer before he hears... It is folly and shame to him. One translation reads, He who answers a matter before he hears it, it's folly and shame to him. Think about that principle as you think about conversations that you've had with others, whether it was in your marriage or not. And especially if it was a conversation that involved disagreement. If you were having a conversation with someone and, and, and you didn't see eye to eye and so perhaps you're debating your, your, your point with the other person, isn't it the case that sometimes we find ourselves, while the other person is talking, we find ourselves already formulating our response that we're going to give whenever we get the opportunity instead of truly listening to what the other person is saying? Now, I don't know if you're like me or not. I hope in, the, in this instance you're not, because I find myself doing that sometimes. More, well, any time I do it, I shouldn't, and so that's one time too many. But I find myself doing it a lot. That instead of truly listening to the other person to understand fully and completely where they're coming from, I'm already working in the back of my mind, or maybe even in the front of my mind, for my response whenever I get the opportunity. Now, what's the foolishness in that? 
Well, you think about it for a moment and it hits you. How can I properly respond to something that I haven't even heard completely yet? How can I offer the best response to someone when that someone hasn't given me yet everything that I need to consider in order to make an appropriate response? I'm doing exactly what Proverbs warns me against. I'm answering a matter before I've even heard the whole matter. And God says that is foolishness. How can we reply to something we don't understand? And how can we understand something if we don't listen first? So when it comes to our marriages specifically, we're going to have, have those times when we don't agree with each other on a particular issue, particular matter. If we want to communicate well, let's devote ourselves first and foremost to listening well. Listen to understand first before speaking. That's principle number one. Number two, measure your words. Measure your words before you say them. Measure your words. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 2. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly. But the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. Now I want you to get the gist of a couple of these proverbs. That on the one hand, you've got an individual who's described as using knowledge in a wise manner, as opposed to the foolish person who just pours forth. Okay, You see the difference? There's one on the one side that, that's acting wisely, and that's the opposite of this person, and they're pouring forth what's on their mind. So what does the wise person do? Well, he's not doing what the foolish person does. He's not just simply pouring forth whatever's coming into his mind. He's measuring his words. Or you might consider Proverbs 15, verse 28. Proverbs 15, 28. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. So again, on the one hand, you've got one who studies how to answer and the other one who just simply pours forth. If we want to be good communicators, we need to measure our words, weigh our words, think before we speak. Do you see a man hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Proverbs 29, verse 20. How many times are we just too hasty? We're just too quick to respond instead of stopping. Again, listening to the other person and considering their position so that you completely understand where they're coming from and then measuring your words to respond. And somebody may think, well, you know what? You can't argue that way. Exactly. You can't. Maybe that's the point. Measure your words. You can't unscramble eggs. You can't unring a bell. You can't unspeak words. Once they're out there, they're out there. You can't take them back. Now, I know we use that language. I know we use that terminology. Sometimes we say something that we shouldn't. We realize we've said something we shouldn't. And we say, oh, I, I take it back. I take it back. Well, you can't. You can apologize for poorly chosen words. And that's good. And we should do that. And, but as much as we would like to retrieve our words once they're spoken, we cannot do that. Once they're out there, they're out there. Measure your words. Number next. Make sure that what you say is true. Make sure that what you say 
is true. Do not lie to one another. Colossians 3 verse 9. And that includes anybody, but certainly your spouse. Speak the truth, and when you do, speak it in love. Ephesians 4 verse 15. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. And you might think, well, that that should go without saying, that, that you should speak the truth. Well, it should perhaps go without saying, but it probably needs to be said. Sometimes we can be so concerned about saving face, winning the argument, justifying our actions that will result to saying things that really aren't true. God's not pleased with that. Number next, principles of good communication. Number next, when you are wrong, admit it and seek forgiveness. When you are wrong, admit it and seek forgiveness. Confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another that you may be healed. James 5 verse 16. Certainly that should be the arrangement that we have in our homes, in our marriages. is for the ability to admit when we're wrong and seek forgiveness and have that forgiveness granted. So when you're wrong, admit it. And sometimes you are. I want to say, make this next statement kindly, but uh, I want to be understood as well. If your spouse has never heard you say, I'm sorry, then you have a good reason to say that right now. If you are wrong, and sometimes you are, admit it. And seek forgiveness. Number next. Principles of communication. How you say it is as important as what you say. How you say it is as important as what you say. We talked a moment ago about speaking truth. We need to do that. But we also need to remember that we need to speak the truth in the proper way. Some people, I'm afraid, operate under the destructive notion that only the content of our speech matters. That as long as we are speaking the truth, then it really doesn't matter how we say it. I don't believe that's right. And I don't believe that's right because of what the Bible says. Colossians chapter 4 verse 6 instructs us, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Paul says it's possible for us to know how to answer other people. And he says, you need to know how you ought to answer each person. Well, just by that very language, it tells us that it's possible to answer people in a way that's not productive and that's not right. It does matter how we say things. Our speech is to be seasoned. And it's important how we say things. Let your gentleness be known to all. Philippians 4 verse 5. A soft answer turns away wrath. Proverbs 15, verse 1. But a harsh word, that verse goes on to say, stirs up anger. Does it matter how you say things? It does. A soft answer turns away wrath. I like to put it this way, by way of application. Marriage problems are never solved by shouting the potential solution. 
Marriage problems are never solved by shouting the potential solution. You may be as right as you can be in your position. If you shout it at your spouse, don't expect it to be accepted. It matters how we say things. And the final principle I want you to to think about is really a principle that, that governs all of this. And if we would apply this one principle, we'll all be okay. Always communicate under the, under the direction of the golden rule. You want to fix your communication problems? Apply the golden rule. Matthew seven twelve. As you would have others do to you, you do even so to them. If we would consider that and apply it consistently in the way we speak to one another, whether we're talking marriage or not, if we would apply that principle, our communication skills would go way up. And we would have far fewer difficulties that could be laid at our feet due to bad communication. Do you like to be yelled at? I doubt it. Then don't yell at your spouse. Do you like to have your words twisted into something that you didn't say or intend? Do you like others to do that to you? I doubt it. Don't do it to your spouse. Do you like people to be honest with you? I suspect you do. Be honest with your spouse. Do you like people to speak kindly to you and and put the best spin on your actions? Even when you make a mistake, do you want people to be gracious to you in response to those mistakes? Sure you do. Be gracious to your spouse. Practice the golden rule and our communication will improve. Communication is is vitally important. We should pray about that regularly. One of the things that I appreciate about uh, about Coach David Webb is not he's traveling on business this week, but but I notice that he often includes in his prayers that he leads here in our assemblies that he requests that God would help us to be better communicators. And I've always appreciated that about him and about that being on his mind. Uh, Because I certainly can use that prayer to be a better communicator, and I suspect all of us could in our marriages and in all of our other relationships. Good communication helps in every area of life. And that's, I suspect, why God said as much as He did on the subject. It's up to us to take what He said and apply it. Let us do our best to do that very thing. Pray with me. Gracious Father, we thank you for the time that we've had tonight to consider what you have revealed to us in your word about good communication. We pray that as we apply those principles to our marriages, to our homes, that you would bless us in that, that you would strengthen us, that you would open our eyes to perhaps our our faults, open our eyes that we might see areas in which we don't communicate well, And we pray that you would open our eyes to the solution, that we might be better communicators with each other. And we pray that through our good communication, you would strengthen our relationships. And we pray, Father, that in whatever other areas uh, we stand in need of your help, we pray for it. And we trust that, um, that you will grant it in harmony with your word. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for the forgiveness available to us through Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. We want to offer the invitation of the Lord tonight, as we always do. And if there is someone in this assembly who realizes that you are not a part of the body of Christ, you've not had your sins washed away by the blood of Jesus And you want that to happen. You recognize how lost you are and how terrible that is to be lost. We would love to help you complete your obedience to the gospel. And 
immerse you in water that you might contact the saving blood of Jesus and be raised to walk in newness of life. Romans 6, verses 1 to 5. I know most of you in this gathering tonight are Christians already, but maybe there's something in your life that that you're struggling with and you need uh, the prayers of your Christian family. If you would let us know what your need is, we would be honored to pray with you and for you. Whatever your need might be, we encourage you to come as we stand and sing together. Thank you, Eddie, for those reminders. I'm trying to figure out, though, last time we heard that Mary never is always right, and then he said everyone has to say I'm sorry. I find these to be in conflict with one another. So Mary may just be that exception. We have a couple of things. First of all, it's good to see all of you here, uh, especially our visitors and we hope that you will stick around and, and let us uh, get to know you better. Uh, please do fill out an attendance card and leave it on the pew if you've not already done that. Uh, second thing is due to VBS this morning, or in the morning, Digging Deep class will not meet tomorrow, but the evening class will meet tomorrow night at 7 p.m., so please make your plans accordingly. And then finally, the conclusion, the conclusion of our service, everyone is invited to join us in the NPR for a cookie fellowship. So if we're going to start, if we got barbecue, we're now going to do cookies, I'm sure we're going to get ice cream eventually. I'm, I'm betting on it. So uh, please stick around and we'll do that. If we'll sing one more song and then be led in our closing prayer. Please turn to number 446 if you're using the book.
Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you for your blessings to us, which are so abundant and so much more than what we deserve. We thank you that you've been so richly blessing us by living in this country and having all the things that you've bestowed upon us. We pray, Father, that you'll be with the several members of our congregation who are sick and recovering, and we pray that that will go speedily, that they may return to us. Father, we pray that you'll be with each of us, that we will be better communicators, more considerate of others, both our spouse and those other, others that are around us, and that we will give the others the benefit of the doubt and things, and we pray, Father, that you'll just help us to be kind. Father, we pray you'll forgive us, and we pray that you'll watch over us and save us eternally with you. Through Christ we pray. Amen.